I think um, I will just um, explain a little bit um, the eight precepts. I mean, not eight precepts, this is the procedures of eight precepts. Okay. 我就先就是简单跟大家介绍一下这个流程哦，就是八关斋戒的这个流程。Um, you know, it's um, it's tradition uh, in the Buddhist tradition that um, I mean, especially during the Buddha's time, uh, when you want to take, when you have um, say that if you want to uh, um, hope this. Uh, Well, during the Buddha's time, certainly like Arahant and the Buddha, like a holy person, and then you you hope that those noble person that will uh, bestow you the the kind of advice, but you usually have to request because I guess um, the reason why they, you need to request is uh, you just in a way to show that you sincerely want to learn something or you want to get something. So without a request, uh, normally the monk in old day uh, they will. Just don't hit me, bowed. I mean, in, in other words, I mean they always stay silent, because uh, uh, Buddhist tradition is a little bit different from what we understand as a religion. That we are usually not very imposing the ideas to other person. Um, that's the reason why there's a good part and bad part. In a civilized country, it's very good, but sometimes when in a uh, aggressive country, no, it's not very good because then you are. <laughs> You always keep quiet. People, you know, quiet means sometimes. Re- at the the the, I'm, when I say quiet, I mean it, the monk is not saying that they are not talking. But supposedly now you learn this meditation, you know, uh, and also after what we said yesterday, so you somehow understand the monk usually if they keep quiet, they are working on the heart because they they are, they have to cultivate the mind, right? And this important part. Other unless you really request to do something. Uh, that's why sometimes even by requesting the precept, you have the one word. Here we don't have. There are different version of request. So they, they, they even sometimes say anukampang. You know, so it means uh, out of uh, consideration. You know, out of uh, considering with your love, with your compassion. Please, you know, give me the precept or advise me the precept and so forth. Right. So I want to say is that. Um, Uh, but then, uh, that usually, if you if you don't ask that, so the monk will just quite keep quiet, so, because everybody understand that you need to really almost like you you are you are cultivating your your mind, right? So that that's the reason why they keep quiet. Unlike other religion, other religion they don't really have this emphasis or have this stress or have this kind of even idea cultivating the mind. That's why they only thinking that you need to have a conversion, right? Or maybe the conversion of what it originally come almost like there's a dialogue going on. But then through the dialogue, then you you certain understand uh, the meaning, and then you being uh, uh, kind of like you accept what those means in, meaning for you, and then you being convert into their their understanding. You know what I'm saying? So, but uh, that's why in order to break this kind of silence, that monk would pay attention to you rather than just pay attention on the the act, the mind. So then you have a request, um, and this is one reason. The second reason why we had to request, and many things in, in tradition, you have to understand those tradition first. It's also something to do with the karma. Also, it's uh, even though in Buddhist understanding, uh, among the karma, the most Important part. We usually we divide the karma in the three uh, that can be manifested in three way, right? One way is that manifested in your mind, on your mind, and one way is manifested in your verbal. One way is manifested uh, on uh, in uh, in your uh, bodily action. Uh, even though in the Buddhist uh, understanding, the uh, among these karma, the most important is your mind, uh, but still. Uh, in even though it's a mind, because everything is initiated by the mind. However, still the bodily or verbal action could, uh, how to say, could enhance the 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 karma, uh, or enhance in a way mean it can give more weight on the karma. Or well, if I don't want to use the word karma, it would give more weight on the action. Uh, for example. Uh, if I have an idea, I want to ask something, but that's just just my idea, right? 
But without this idea, nothing can would, would work. However, if I have the idea, I want to ask something, but I don't use my mouth to ask. Then uh, you you that then no people or basically mean I won't, I don't want to say other people, just even myself. Even I have the idea to ask, but then if I don't open my mouth to say something, then this idea can be very weak in a certain sense. Okay. But this is interesting. Even though it's like that, then still Buddhism think the idea is the um, most, uh, how to say, uh, uh, is, the, is the crucial or is a role of, of, the, of the action or of the karma. Because they, in the Buddhist Sutra, there's a debate between one of the religions called Jainism. Uh, at least that's record, not in the Jainism record, but in the Buddhist scripture record that during the debate, uh, one of the lay person, um, what is them already? Suddenly it's not in my mind. Anyway, one of the lay person, he's a, one of the kind of like foremost uh, lay devotee of the Jainism. And he thought because he learned Jainism so well, and even though there's a lot of saying the Buddha is really good at kind of like uh, you know, answering the question and uh, debate. Even some have this kind of hearsay that the Buddha have the power, not the power. Even the Buddha have this kind of uh, uh, charm, you know, like a, uh, the, the, the magic charm. So a kind of charm that anyone who meet the Buddha, he use a charm to intoxicate the person kind of like this, so that the people would just somehow be, believe in Buddhism later on, you know. And that's kind of, you know, uh, you know these kind of rumors go, go in. So then when this, I think his name is Upali, yes, then Upali, he asked, he told his uh, master, uh, Nigandanata Buddha, and he said, no worry, I know he's very, uh, everybody say he have a charm, have a magic, so I still want to go to a debate with him because he believed that he could convince the Buddha the Jainese, the Jainese religion is best than the Buddhism, kind of something like that. So anyway, during the debate, one of the, one of the great debate is in the earlier time is then, because Jainism really believe in the bodily action as the main cause of the karma. And the Buddhism certainly do, do not think that the mind as a main cause of the karma. That's why we say Jetanaham Bikkhawe, Kama Vadami, meaning the Buddha saying, uh, you know, uh, the intention is the initiate of the karma, right? But it manifests through the mind process and the verbal process as well as the physical process, okay? And uh, that debate, uh, I'm not going to talk in the detail because it's a long time. But generally, the, during that debate, so then the Upali later understand because uh, that, like the Buddha says something, at least that how they believe in India in those days, is that one of, there are many arguments. One argument the Buddha say, you know, even though you use a knife, you know, you want to kill someone, so it takes a lot of effort to kill someone. But it's still there's a belief in India. If the people are very powerful in their training, in the mind, so when they have an evil mind, if they want to kill someone, they just one thought, a lot of people will die. So, and that's how in during the debate, and the Ubani understood, yeah, the mind should be more powerful in a way, and it should be the, the cause of the karma, you know. Um, I want to say that, um, so that's the reason why in Jainism, they're very strict, many things. You know, uh, uh, they when they practice, even sometimes, like they have to use uh, uh, the mask. You know, because they don't want to breathe. Breathe, they need filter. If they don't have a filter, they think then they will kill a lot of uh, germ or the living thing while you're breathing even. And some when you walk, you need to sweep on the floor in the front because they don't want that when you're walking your feet will step on something and kill something, you know. Uh, but in the Buddha, Buddhism believe that you don't commit the killing unless you know there's a living thing on there and you deliberately want to kill. And not only just deliberately want to kill, and that things really die, so that means you really commit the, the, uh, the killing, you know. 
In other words, mean first thing is about your intention. If the intention wanted to kill, then you really committed a killing. But if the intention you didn't have killed, but you just don't know and something died, so you don't commit that kind of karma. Of course, maybe that thing don't like you. I mean, let's say the insect may become an insect ghost. I'm just joking. And then they will come to, you know, haunting you all the time, become an insect ghost. But at least in terms of your own karma, you, you don't really do that. But, you know, you, there's no, um, uh, you don't commit that kind of karma. So anyway, I mean, back to here, I mean, so that's because of this reason. First, initially, your mind has to really request, and second, and then uh, if, in order to make that become much more, how to, much more strong, so you need to uh, utter in a verbal, okay? That's why then you request. When you request, um, even in the general and Pali, yeah, actually here is, uh, no, there's no Arukampa. So anyway, so just say that uh, asking the, the teacher to give you the precepts, okay? Okay, and then after that, so then you have to uh, do the homage to the Buddha. Usually you say, Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa. Okay, and others mean the word Namo, Namo is Namah uh, in Sanskrit. It's generally, uh, well, there's a lot of explanation, but generally you just understand it mean uh, it's a kind of uh, a respectful way of addressing, you know. Uh, uh, somebody say that nama can be mean closing the palm and so forth. But anyway, it means just a, a kind of wishing someone you know, good. And then uh, when you have a Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa, in general, understand that uh, the Buddha it's not just an Arahant also, but he is also usually addressed as a Bhagava and then Sama Sambuddha. Okay, and in in Chinese uh, you could say just. Uh, uh, and then uh, um, when, when the Buddha, it's only usually the Arahan, you don't call Arahan as in like the Bhagavad, you also don't address the Arahan, uh, you have the kind of title or the name or the title, you don't call the, the Arahan someone who are fully enlightened, but it's not a Buddha, you don't call them as a Sama Sambuddha. That's why in explanation later, that um, when we say the Buddha is a, the Bhagava, still in India they use the same term Bhagava when they have a very advanced guru, they think is a, one of the very powerful guru they use as a Bhagava. Uh, but uh, etymologically, a Bhagava have a different kind of uh, uh, how does explanation? But generally, Bhagava, I like to understand is or translate in the term, even though usually we translate as a blessed one, you know. Uh, but I think it's a really uh, kind of honorary form. But the meaning Bhagava generally means one who is the most lucky person, something called a Bhagava. It it carries that the meaning because you say in Indian understanding is that someone if they can become a most powerful person or most spiritual person most uh, like an uh, enlightened person, then they, had, they must have the kind of like a luck, you know, you know what I'm saying? You know, that, that kind of Asian way of understanding. So that's why Bhagavan actually have the meaning, mean the most lucky one, that no one can, no one are so lucky as him like that, you know, that he could do all the things, he could become a Buddha and, and so forth. That's why uh, that's the term, it's the term Bhagavan. And even now, as I say, in India, they, they still use, not really, but they still use, they call some very powerful, the yoga the teacher, I mean, yoga teacher, not like this stretching, I mean, the spiritual teacher, so and then as a Bhagavad as well. But the term Samma Sambuddha is really Buddhist, a Buddhist term in a way, because the Samma Sambuddha, <coughs> and the Sanskrit Samyak Sambuddha, it refers to Samma, it's, uh, in Pali, the Sama could be mean someone is even, okay? Uh, in Sanskrit, Samyak have two meaning. It can be mean correct, you know, and sometimes it can be mean even as well. That's the reason why in Chinese, when they translate this Samyak Sambuddha or Sama Sambuddha, not from a Pali, it's very clear because uh, it's due to the Sanskrit uh, uh, language reason. So, 
the Sanskrit translate the term samya, zhen, oh, but sometimes zhen can be even, but sometimes also can be understood as the correct, right? But when, when you see the explanation in Chinese, it looks like they prefer the samya as understood as the correct more than mean the even. Anyway, I'm not here to say in this kind of thing because this is really complicated uh, when you learn this uh, and how really understand Sama Sambodo. In general, the term Sama Sambodo has been addressed by the Buddha, only the person who gained the enlightenment by himself, you know, uh, almost like the founder of that, uh, uh, as the Buddha said in the, the path uh, to say, uh, he walked on the old, old city. Do you know that uh, one of the family, famous simile called the old city simile? And then the Buddha say, uh, when he was practicing, when he was cultivating before his enlightenment, so he entered one of the old city as a figurative way of saying that he actually found the vulnerable truth. So, so we don't say foul, put it in a term. The best way to say the Buddha is rediscover the vulnerable truth, because the vulnerable truth is always there. But just the Buddha has able to explore, uh, like, uh, like uh, Bariyaya Sutta say, because from the very beginning, when the Buddha had become, when he renounced his life, he had a different understanding from what that time in India understand spirituality is about. Because in, at that time, people understand spirituality mean, you know, if they can meditate well, they can emerge their soul with the, the creator, kind of like that. That's how the Hindu, Indian religion, I won't say only Hindu, Indian religion, Hindu is a very complicated term. But the Indian religion in general understand. But the Buddha think that, uh, basically he have a very different idea. His, I'm not going to say those things, but the idea generally is saying that, you know, if anything that will give you a rise, mean born, a rise again, but this must not be able to conduce you to be a noble uh, uh, teaching. Thing has to be seized rather than things has to be arise, basically. I mean, this is, a, that's why I say, if, even in philosophical, this is a very complicated, difficult uh, uh, thing. So that's the reason why he, anyway, because of that, he looked at even suffering the term, it's not dukkha, the term is not only used in the Buddhism. Almost all religion talk about dukkha, right? Suffering, you understand? However, the Buddhism understand the dukkha, uh, like all religion tell you the life he suffer, that's why you need to believe, you know? That somehow carry this kind of meaning. But the thing it is, the Buddhism talk about it, suffering. Sometimes when we explain, we explain we are not addressing the life have some difficulty. We are addressing the life have the nature of the suffering or oppression, sometimes we call that. Okay? That's why when we explain the suffering, we explain suffering as the dukkha, as a dukkha da. Uh, da mean in the, with the nature of that. So then how can you, how someone can really and in the nature. So it's of course, ultimately you understand the, the nature of the suffering in terms of the vulnerable truth. That's what they say, the Buddha rediscover the vulnerable truth because the Dharma, this kind of nature is always there, okay? But only you must have the wisdom to explore that kind of nature, so, all right. That's why we call the Sama Sambuddha. Okay, I will just explain one more, and then we can just take the precepts. Okay, and later, after when you honor the Buddha, because you still always uh, remember, even actually during the Buddha's time, it's the same thing. It's almost like you know, uh, it's uh, always to address before you take the precept. You need to even in front of Buddha, you have to say, "Oh, Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddha." I mean, do you have to still say respect to? Uh, uh, Bhagava, because as I say, the lucky one of you, and then uh, you could understand it's like then Arahan, the one who cut off all the reincarnation, uh, and then uh, as a Samasambuddha, I mean the one who who actually kind of like uh, 
by himself he discovered the, the, the teaching and then explored it and then also delivered the teaching to you know everybody so that they can become arahant and so forth. So that's called Samasambuddha. So you still remember uh, this, uh, what we call the guna. You still have to remember this kind of the uh, collection uh, good thing. Just like when you address somebody is a doctor, when you address somebody is a lawyer, you kind of know what not necessarily clearly, but you kind of have this kind of understand this person have what kind of quality, right? As a lawyer quality, as a businessman quality. I don't know how do you understand businessman, but you know what I'm saying, and so forth. That kind of thing. So you need to address that. After that, then you take the refuge. <clears throat> the refuge, when you say Budang Saranagachami, Dhamma Saranagachami, Sangha Saranagachami, the refuge is also crucially important because. Uh, uh, in the Buddhism, it's also out of very different other religion. In other religion, you usually just think that all oh, because you believe in this, you believe in that. But in Buddhism, when you really are saying that I am a Buddhist or I am I am I am devoted in Buddhism, you cannot just say I only believe in Buddha. I don't believe in Dharma, <laughs> and then I don't believe in Sangha. There's no such a thing. You have to really understand uh, from the very earlier time. This is actually. It's a very complex concept. Even though nowadays people take it very slightly, but it's not true. In the Buddha's time, when you believe in something, it's always when you have a Buddha, then you have to remember the teaching. Okay, and then when you always remember the teaching, you have to remember his noble disciple. Okay, understand? So that's why every time you need to remember the Buddha. At the same time, you remember his teaching, and because of the teaching, so that would help to create, you could say create, that will produce that, the noble disciples. That's why you have the, the Buddha and Dharma and Sangha. Okay, okay. all right. I guess, uh, and also I was told today, uh, I was informed that somebody asked to take the prison in Chinese as well. So what I would do is, uh, <clears throat> we will just, why don't we just do like that and uh, we chant that in the party first, and then we can uh, wait for a little while for the people who say that in Chinese. Okay, everything just follow that. Right? We chant that in party, and and later we say that in Chinese. Now I like to explain a little bit why we want to chant that in party. Well, in in the Theravada tradition, or sometimes we call it as the Southern Buddhist tradition, uh, it's usually has a kind of culturally believe that that's the language of the Buddha. But to be more precise, I would not say that. I would not say that it's a, it's a language of the Buddha because sometimes when we say it's a language of Buddha, I mean the Buddha only speak the language, right? That, that carry that meaning. According to Buddha Gosa, actually, how, because we know that uh, Buddhism brought to Sri Lanka uh, by the, one of his son, the king, the, 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 uh, one of the son of the Asoka, the king Asoka, and he became a monk, and, and he became Arahant. And he came to Sri Lanka, and he used to live in the, that time in the capital of what that time the so-called uh, Mayura, Mayura, or Peacock, you know, Mayura means Peacock Empire. During the, the Peacock Empire, the capital of the Peacock Empire is in Magadha, the, the place called Magadha. So Mahinda, as the son of the King Asoka, okay, he, he also lived in Magadha. So when he brought the Buddhism to Sri Lanka, he still recite the Buddhist text in this language, so-called Pali now. Okay? But literally Pali actually is not a language, the word. Pali sometimes understand as mean sacred text, understand? So almost like when everybody speaks the same language in that, that time, they don't care. They don't want to put a name for this language name. There's no name for this language in India, you know. Like, oh, so literally the Pali, it means uh, sacred text. So, however, when it came, but certainly it's different kind of language. Certainly it's very different from Sri Lankan language. So when the language came and people, he, the way that people understand that's the language the Buddha speak to. But it's much to do with how you understand what does the Buddha spoke that language. Okay. But when the Buddha goes uh, 
later on when they do the commenting, I guess he's not writing that uh, with, uh, he definitely write that with carefully. He write that, he just want to explain the language when we say this is the Buddha language, it means because that's the language used in Magadha. Okay, understand? Uh, and also, most of the time, as you look at the, during the Buddha's time, the Buddha has been living in many, many places. There are so many like uh, Vihara, okay? Like uh, many places, like sometimes he live in New York, like almost like that, and sometimes he live in Maryland, sometimes maybe, even very, very rare, but live in maybe George, uh, uh, Georgia, very far away, but he lived different places. But most of the time, the time he stayed, most of the time, it's in uh, Magadha, around the Magadha. That's the reason why you could argue that then if this language at that time mostly used in the Magadha, it means this is a language that the Buddha many spoken. He spoke many different languages, that's for sure. So he many speak the language using in the Magadha because he lived that area for 27 years. Yeah. So I understood, okay. Even though nowadays people take it, oh, this is a Buddha language, I, get, I, I don't usually take it that way. It means that's a language the Buddha many years during his time. Because it's clear the Buddha knows many languages. If you look at the, uh, the Sutta, the Buddha all, many times explained that, you know, about the language problem. So, and that's the reason why in the Buddhism we don't have the, uh, not like in the, like a Muslim or other religion, even in Christian also in the earlier time, they don't allow you to use any language, only Latin, right? And then when the first British, uh, British people who translate the text into English, he was killed, murder. <laughs> because they think it's not holy. Uh, it's not what, but uh, in Buddhism actually on, on the, uh, on the, conversely, the, the Buddha advised people, you must use your own language to, to deliver the, 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 the teaching, okay? But that's a good part, but difficult part for us is, <laughs> like I, I used to learn different Buddhist language, there are so many different manuscripts. And <clears throat> that's why I'm very sensitive with the Pali language and Sanskrit or even sometimes Chinese or whatever. Uh, because, because when during that, because if nowadays we, we like an Afghanistan uh, just 40, 50 years ago, so like they found some manuscript. So they have a very different language. Even though the language is close to Sanskrit and Pali, but you know, it's still different language. You don't understand well, unless you're really, really good at the language or what. So that's why, because during the Buddha's time, they advised the monks, they should use their language to deliver the teachings. But at the end, you end up with so many different languages, manuscripts, so you have to really, and uh, that's one of the problems. Our second problem is Sanskritized, but later on, during the, the, after the first century, almost like end of the first century, and then the king, Kanishka, he changed the language also, because he wanted to uh, official the language into Sanskrit, so-called Sanskrit, but they always have different names. So-called Sanskrit, at least the language is like what they call their ancient Vedic language, you know, Vedic language. So that's why, because since Buddhism been, trans, uh, been used in different language, later on, you need to transcribe the language back to the Sanskrit. That's why we have a lot of problem, a lot of problem, even in terms of language. Anyway, okay, now you understand what the Pali mean. Generally mean Pali just mean a sacred, language, sacred text, but then it become a term in order to mean a language, because that trying to just designate to the language during the time the Buddha lived in Magadha, mostly used, understand, okay? So, of course, to that is, you could understand that nowadays, because this language is dead already, no more exists. So, you could understand that it was more like the, uh, one of the holy language, okay? All right. Uh,就是我们如果在宋界的时候,因为刚刚所有时间用中文呢,其实我当然认为你们最好是跟着巴黎文念,因为我就至少解释一下,就是因为 巴黎文其实简单的简单巴黎文本来就是一个语言这个语言呢一般在佛陀时代来讲就是他用的最多的一个语言当佛陀会讲很多语言所以呢为什么在这个传统他们一直保留这个语言每个和尚不管他懂
。虽然大家不知道为什么学佛，就这么认为。其实这个是非常确定的。不管你是汉译的，他你看中文的这个，你看什么文都好，就是说都有记载，在尤其是我们的出家人的戒律里面都有记载。就是其实刚好相反，佛陀是禁止大家一定要用梵文去讲课，懂听得懂吗？刚好是相反。当初因为发生了这个问题，就是就就就在家中，啊，不是出家中，因为他们因为都是婆罗门嘛，所谓婆罗门就是用现代的角度来看，就是现代我们所谓的就宗教师吧，啊，但是那些宗教师可能不是像讲哦，去念个书啊，啊，就是当宗教师，他要侍从的，就他爸爸都是宗教师，本来就很背，很会背，学了很多，要把他教他给了小孩子，从小小小他就要背全部他们的宗教的东西，好，所以那个。像那种，因为后来就是有些这种所谓的宗教师，他们就是变成佛教去了，然后就出家去，出家去了。当然，在这个传统上，就像中国人也会有他的传统认为，哎呀，你怎么这么丢脸呢、啊？你怎么会跑到另外一个地方去啊？我们自己本来不是有这个吗？好，那么当然，在佛陀时代一定会发生这种问题。所以有几个很有名的比丘，他的家世都是非常好，都是有名的宗教师，师从下来，但是他竟然出家去了，他们就觉得很丢脸。就说他这还没有关系，你出家就算了。既然这个老师都不常常讲梵文，懂吗？因为在他们的印度文化里面，梵文好像是个最神圣的语言，是神的语言，就是这样。竟然还这样，所以呢，当初后来佛陀还告诉他，后来佛陀就因为这件事，他们这几个比丘去跟请求佛陀，就说佛陀，请你讲好了，你规定我们将来我们的这个身众全部都用梵文，刚好相反，大家读戒律都知道这个事了。那么，其实经里面虽然没有讲解，但是经里面有这个意思哈。那么就是说到说，当初因为这样子的事情，所以佛陀就跟他说啊、呃，就跟他讲，我不允许任何人，因为为了一些特殊的原因，他一定要讲梵文。我只是允许说，他应该用他自己啊、呃，就是那个别人能沟通的语言去跟他沟通，就是这个就是定成了后来我们佛教其实对于这个语言的看看待方式。但是当然，过了到公元一世纪，佛陀灭后大概五百多年了。那么当然，这个历史有点改变，因为国王你知道吗？他为了统一这个国家，他当然要统一这个语言。在统一这个语言的时候，他就规定要把一切的东西要泛文化。当然，佛教很自然嘛，受到这个国家的政策的改变，所以这个啊、呃，整个的虽然佛教学习佛法，我们学习佛教其实蛮复杂的，因为。留下来的，我先不讲中文，中文都是翻译的，就是本来的语言呢，其实还蛮多资料，但是这种语言有些我们已经看不太懂了。那么，但是就不管怎么样，但是这个过程里面呢，这些语言呢，都一定要给它就是泛文化，我们叫 Sanskritize， 把它再转化成泛文去。所以，如果我们学语言，我们会发现很多复杂的问题存在的，因为你知道，转一个语言过去的时候，啊。中文都会出问题了，不要说这种，中文还是一个象形字的，哈，都会出问题。它这种的发音的或者这个意思的，整个意思有时候会不能说差很多，但是总是会转变，对不对？所以就在这转换过程呢，就发生了蛮多问题，哈。当然，不管怎么样，所以我直接解释，如果从佛教来讲，这个我们讲的这个不是说啊，今天我在乱说的，这个都是全部在佛经都有的，好，或者经藏啊，就是论论藏啊，或者是都有的。最少佛陀肯定是不要，当然他没有，也没有说禁止你用梵文，只是说因为梵文是在那个时代，你会讲梵文，意思说你就是一个宗教师，你是因为梵文在古在佛陀时代是非常严重的，有一种低阶级的人，有些地方呢、啊，当然不是整个印度，就是有些地方哈，如果你是低阶级的人呢、啊，你会背梵文呢、啊，他会把你用哑的，他觉得你是侮辱了这个语言，懂吗？他是严重到这样，所以他们有一种很骄傲、很尊贵一种观念。你知道佛教佛陀肯定是很觉得这是不对的，不能信的，所以开始就不认为说你应该只有用梵文，啊，更何况你规定了要把它大家都不能再讲你自己的语言去沟通啊，讲这个佛法反而要用梵文，所以就这样子，所以就改成了啊，简单的说就是佛陀就说。反而规定了出家人的戒律，才不是戒律，就是出家人的一个大家。业数呃，怎么业数成规吗？数业成什么什么怎么中文怎么说？约定成规，对约定成规的一种一种了解，就是你不能说我只有用这个语言再去啊、呃、弘扬佛教，就这样对。好的，那当然我是觉得你在
既然来了这里，好有这个机会送一送八零也不错。不过当然了，呃，本来这个。如果你们觉得要送中文，我们就反正现在我们这样决定，就先送一个巴黎文，然后我们停一下，你们就念中文 ，OK，OK，OK，We、okay. okay. okay. can just begin to take the precepts now.